Hey, everybody, this is Ben Bowman. Welcome back to another episode of The Oregon Bridge. Thousands of people have found ways of working together to continually make it a better city. I was convinced that the strongest antidote to the problems was not Citizens United, but Citizens Uniting. Those abiding democratic strengths can be used to address the deepening democratic threats in our political culture. All right, folks, uh, what a treat today. Um, today, I got to speak to Daniel Chemis, and Daniel is a giant figure in uh, the politics of the American West. He was a legislator in Montana. He became minority leader. He served as speaker in the Montana uh, legislature and then ran for mayor of Missoula served for two terms as the mayor of Missoula. And he's a he's a prolific author who's written some incredible books, one of which uh, we spent a lot of time talking about today. It is this book, um, Community and the Politics of Place. Uh, his most recent book, which came out in 2020, is Citizens Uniting uh, to Restore Our Democracy. Um, he He's an award-winning writer. He's an award-winning thinker. Um, he was awarded the Charles Frankel Prize by President Bill Clinton for his outstanding contribution to the field of the humanities. He also won the Wallace Stegner Prize. Uh, we talk about Wallace Stegner's uh, quote, a quote from him today from the Center for the American West. Um, and Daniel's a fascinating and incredibly intellectually gifted person on a couple different levels. But what he brings to the table that few other people do are deep experience in on the ground governance, serving in the role of mayor, serving in the role of speaker, state representative, um, and knowing the pushes and pulls of those jobs, but also serving as a sort of like historian and um, political philosopher. And he, like he's developed frameworks that are really useful for thinking about solving problems, um, and particularly in a context in the American West, which we talk about a little bit, the role of geography and why place matters so much and how it's central to his belief about um, how we navigate the moment that we are uh, in today. So a wide ranging conversation, a few things to look for. I think uh, I, I did it a little different in this episode because Daniel is from Montana and some of my Oregonian uh, listeners might not know him. I, I jumped right into content before we talked much about biogra biography. And the first example that we talk about is about how we make decisions and the sort of default decision making that exists in uh, contemporary politics. Um, and then an alternative that ha has also worked and that, um, you know, we don't talk about it in the episode, but Oregon actually has several examples of community based decision making um, that have been sustained over um, years and in some cases decades that I think we have a lot to be proud of. But we talk about how to make decisions. We talk about place. We talk about um, living together in a divi divided country, how to revitalize public life, how to navigate the moment that we are uh, living in, the the tension between rugged individualism and cooperation, as uh, Stegner notes. Um, and then we talk about his advice for people navigating um, the current political climate and the challenges that we face. I really enjoyed talking to Daniel and I think you will too. And I do want to make a plug for this book. I think this book was written in 1990. Um, yeah, it was it, the, the copyright is from 1990. And as I mentioned to him, like it, it, it really is relevant um, to this moment of, of politics. And so I think if you're interested in the conversation and you found the conversation um, stimulating or challenging, or you, you have questions about it, we really scratch the surface of what is a, a really well-developed framework for thinking about um, governance uh, that he's that Daniel has developed. And this is a great starting point. Um, he's got a couple other books that also dive more deeply on it. Um, we talk about Portland uh, a little bit at the end. I just kind of share my uh, how I connect his work to what's happening in Portland. So if you're going to be a leader in the city of Portland and um, you're trying to figure out how it might look in this new form of government and how to restore faith in the place where these, where, where people live. Um, I think there's, I think there's some clues. There's some ideas that might be useful um, from chemist's work. 
Um, so with that, I will end the introduction and, and tell you all as listeners, thank you for supporting the podcast. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed this week's episode with Daniel Chemis. All right, Daniel Chemis, uh, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Good to be here. Well, so I, I will just start by um, saying to you that it is really a treat to to get to chat with you. Um, when I was I, I was running for the state legislature uh, in the 2022 cycle, and I met with Governor John Kitzhaber, who I know you know, um, and had a really good conversation with him, and I, I wanted to get his endorsement in my run. And so I think I, we had a couple conversations and he asked me for my mailing address and uh, I sent him my mailing address and I, I received a copy of this book in the mail, Community and the Politics of Place. Um, unfortunately, I, it, it sat on my bookshelf until this most recent winter break just a couple weeks ago when I finally got to read it. And it was incredibly impactful um, to me. And as I was telling you before we started recording, it uh, it doesn't feel like it was written uh, in 1990 or whenever you published this. It feels uh, timely and, and prescient right now. Um, so I'm really excited to, to get to talk to you about the book. Well, I'm very happy to be here, especially since Governor Kitzhaber helped lay the path for this. Um, I still have great admiration for my old friend, Governor Kitzhaber. Me too. Me too. Um, so, so Daniel, I think I want to start in the middle of the book um, because it's, I was trying to think, you know, my, my audience is a lot of like um, political staffers, elected officials, lobbyists, people who are kind of in the mix um, of governance, of public policy. And I think the the piece that was most impactful to me, I actually emailed Governor Kitzhaber about this piece, was you're kind of talking about how decisions get made. You've already talked about the sort of philosophical underpinnings with with Jefferson and Hamilton. But the the concrete example is about public hearings. Um, and I'm going to read uh, a, an excerpt from the book uh, about how you describe public hearings and the kind of contradiction of the term public hearing. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about the alternative um, to the, the more bureaucratic or process um, focused approach. So here's the excerpt. In fact, out of everything that happens at a public hearing, the speaking, the emoting, the efforts to persuade the decision maker, the presentation of facts, the one element that is almost totally lacking is anything that might be characterized as a public hearing. A visitor from another planet might reasonably expect that at a public hearing, there would be a public not only speaking to itself, but also hearing itself. Public hearing in this sense would be part of an honest conversation, which the public holds with itself. But that almost never happens. Uh, and then you go on later and you say, when we say that citizens are entitled to due process, we mean that no public entity may infringe on any person's right to life, liberty, or property without giving that person notice of the intended action and an opportunity to be heard in response to it. The public hearing provides this opportunity to be heard, but to be heard by whom? By those with the responsibility for making the ultimate decision. Public decision makers are thus constitutionally encumbered by the responsibility to hear. But the duty to hear does not extend beyond the decision maker. Those who testify are not encumbered by any such responsibility. You go on from there, but it struck me as so true that in the legislature, for example, and I know at local government, the way it works is you've got your decision makers. They sit a little bit higher than everybody else. They've got their microphones. They've got their nameplates. And everybody comes and gets their two or three or five minutes to make their case to them. And then they leave the room. And whoever's next comes up and then we basically say, OK, decision makers, you're in charge, make the decision. Um, and that's that. What's the what's the down? What's the drawback of that system? Why isn't that an ideal way to govern? I think that um, what I was trying to get at there is that in a more richly democratic culture that um, citizens would not only be presenting their own points of view, their own interests and so on, but would actually be engaged in 
conversation, recognizing that any issue uh, that requires a public hearing is probably not a simple yes or no, black or white kind of issue, mm -hmm. but one that in the end has to be resolved somewhere in the middle. It may be quite a bit to one side or the other, but, but the difficulty I was trying to get out with public, the, with that way of doing public hearings is that we assume that the only responsibility of the citizen is to present, mm -hmm. not to engage in the kind of deliberation that might finally result in, in a useful resolution. That's right. And you, you say later um, that these kinds of processes where it's like everybody come in and talk to the decision makers, they do two things. Uh, it invites people to shed any responsibility for the decision or for hearing or responding to one another. Uh, and two, it actually diminishes the ability to actually get something done, um, which are obviously unintended consequences, right? When we're designing the system, we're not trying to disinvite people from participating, or at least usually I, I would hope. Um, but it, stri it just strikes me that that's exactly how most decisions get made unless we build an alternative. And so I'm kind of curious to you, can you describe what an alternative to that model might look like and where has it worked in Montana? Well, actually, I think that across the West, especially after the publication of that book and several other books sort of along the same line, that what we saw, especially in the natural resource and public lands arena, we saw the emergence of a new way of going at public business. Um, and let me just focus on the public lands for a while. Great. Um, from, the, from the outset of the public land system, um, the uh, the public hearing of the kind that you read about had become absolutely essential um, to the whole uh, decision making process, but it also over time became deeply unsatisfying mm -hmm. um, to many of the participants who came to feel that, yes, we go, we do our public hearing, we present our side of the story, we end up with decisions that are not really satisfying to either side, or we end up with gridlock and nothing mm -hmm. happening. And so what began to happen in the 1990s and beyond was more and more people involved with that process began to step outside of that stream of decision making and to, to say, what if we just sat down and talked about this watershed or whatever? And what the result over several years was really a movement that came to be called the collaboration movement, where people from opposite sides of public land issues almost as a matter of course, began to work on, re on solving problems outside of the procedures that had been set up in statutes. So that's the, the clearest example I can think of where it really had broad 
application. So what, how do we do that? How do we incentivize that kind of um, decision-making um, when it, when is it advisable? I think sometimes it probably does make sense to make sure that you have, um, you know, an elected government with an obligation to the public um, making a final decision. But obviously for some of these, the, deci- the, the, the final decisions are much more lasting and probably do better for all the different sides when it's a more collaborative approach. So does it take the government sort of granting the authority or does it take the parties coming together without consulting the government or what's the sort of procedural way that you actually build these sort of spaces? Well, I think it can happen in either of the ways you just mentioned. In the public lands arena, I think for a long time, the the approach was more often people getting together outside of the of the established system and then bringing a solution to the official decision makers since that time i think it's become more common uh, for official bodies whether it's the Forest Service or a legislative committee, to first of all get clear about who who the main opponents are Mm -hmm. and then ask them to sit down together and see how close to a solution they can come. So I think it can happen either way. It's maybe if I had to choose one or the other, I I might be inclined to choose the first way where citizens themselves decide Mm -hmm. to solve a problem simply because they then have that much more stake in making it work. That's. I think that's a really good transition to, I want to bring this to contemporary politics. Um, obviously, a lot has happened in American politics since this book was published. Um, and I would say, broadly, one of the trends that's happened is an increase in polarization, an increase in division, an increase in negativity and negative feelings that we have towards our neighbors based on their political beliefs. Um what role does that play? Is that is that an obstacle we have to overcome? Does it make it harder? Does it make it more important to have a government kind of standing between these sort of warring factions? What do you make of the the sort of negative shift in our politics over the last 30 years? For me, the um, that whole trend toward greater polarization has been pretty deeply disappointing. I think from the time that I wrote that first book and began to see uh, some of the principles unfolding, especially across the West, I thought, well, maybe that's the direction we're going to go. And I think on the ground, close to the ground, We did do a lot of that, but other forces came to play that have have contributed to the polarization that you speak of. I think two big forces are that partisanship has become almost unlimited in in its scope and the the effect of money in politics Mm -hmm. has become truly unlimited Um, and between the two it has made genuine deliberation more difficult even than uh, back in 1990 when the book was published Hmm. You you taught. I want to read a. Uh, I want to read the the Wallace Stegner quote from The Sound of Mountain Water. 
um, and then tie it back to your experience growing up. Um, because I think it actually kind of paints a picture of uh, uh, the conflict in the West sometimes. Okay, here's the quote. Angry as one may be at what heedless men have done and still do to a noble habitat, one cannot be pessimistic about the West. This is the native home of hope. When it fully learns that cooperation, not rugged individualism, is the quality that most characterizes and preserves it, then it will have achieved itself and outlived its origins. Then it has a chance to create a society to match its scenery. What do you what do you make of that? Uh, what's the what is the conflict between uh, rugged individualism uh, and and cooperation in in Western states? I think on the one hand, it's an inevitable and even healthy dynamic. I, um, were, uh, I don't believe in, um, in human history that there's any prospect of us becoming simply cooperative. That's not going to happen. Um, we are individuals. We um, we do pursue individual paths and so on, and I believe we'll keep doing that. Um, so there's a kind of dialectical dynamic between those two things um, that. Um, I I think in some ways is healthy. What what seems to characterize so much of the current polarization is um, that m more and more people seem to have chosen one side of that dynamic or the other hmm. um, to the extent that we've made it more difficult than ever to have meaningful dialogue about what, what a, a thriving balance might be between the two. Um, so that's one of our great challenges now, it seems to me, to recapture some understanding that both of those vectors mm -hmm. um, are important to human well-being um, and to apply ourselves not to some kind of final victory one way or the other, but to a workable balance. I like that a lot. Well, what I... One of the things I really loved in the book that I think kind of helped reframe things for me is sometimes it feels like our choices are, you know, we we're, some people think we should hate each other. They're the bad guys. They don't belong in this country. They're destroying this country. Um, they're evil. They're bad. And then on the other hand, you have the sort of more Pollyanna-ish, like, we all need to love each other. Um, we need to we need to embrace one another. And what your 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 book in in part with this story that I'll ask you to tell uh, about growing up and your mom's feelings about your neighbors, um, it, it's not that we need to love each other. It's not that we have to agree with one another. It's that we need to recognize that we actually need each other, um, and we actually rely on our neighbors regardless of their values or the way they talk or who they vote for, um, which I think is a helpful frame. It's like we don't have to all just. Uh, it's not every not everything's always going to be positive, but every year your neighbors are still going to help you raise the barn or brand the calves or whatever it may be. So can you talk about the the childhood experiences you had and how that translated into a political philosophy? I grew up on a small family farm in far eastern Montana. In the end, it turned out to be too small to sustain our family. Mm -hmm. uh, but that only underscores the that part of the dynamic because it was such a hard country to make a living in. Um, it, people 
quickly under learned that um, that we could there was no chance to make a living there unless we found some ways in some key instances to cooperate with our neighbors. Um, you'd simply, you could not uh, build a barn. You could not, in the old days, uh, harvest a crop um, without the assistance of neighbors. Um, and those lessons then, in a sense, were forced on us by the by how hard it was to live there. But on the other hand, people quickly learned the benefits of, of cooperating, both the, uh, the benefits of actually getting indispensable work done, but also the benefits of being together, socializing, learning about each other, and so on. But the story I told in the book was about one neighbor in particular whose way of being was so <laughs> antithetical to that of my mother that um, she it was all she could do to have him in the house, but she knew he had to be there. We were not gonna get the work done without him. So that impressed itself on me at a very early age. What a powerful, powerful lesson. I mean, the, the natural question from that, Daniel, is, um, well, that's that's great for you and for people who grew up in a rural setting. And there still is this sense of like, we depend on our neighbors. But for people who live in the suburbs or people who live in more urban environments, and I guess the development of new technology in rural places, it seems like the dependence that we have on our neighbors perhaps is declining, or at least um, at least it might we might perceive it that way because of decreased interaction with one another. And so that I think translates us to page 74, where you talk about the ways that we can revitalize public life. And you mentioned um, 4-H clubs, you, me you mentioned volunteer fire departments, uh, you mentioned neighborhood watch programs, a softball league. Um, Give us the give us the framework for how we revitalize public life in a time where we're sort of um, seem to be drifting apart. Shortly after that book was um, written, um, I left the legislature and ran for mayor of Missoula, partly because I was. Um, I was trying to deal with the very question you're asking. I, I was convinced that what, uh, what I had learned from those days on the farm must have applicability beyond that kind of rural setting. Mm -hmm. And I became really fascinated with the question <laughs> excuse me, of um, of how um, it might be possible to bring some of those um, cooperative principles to bear in self-government. And I was pretty convinced, having served in the legislature, that it was even more likely to happen at the local level. And so it was at the local level that I really tried to bring some of the lessons I thought I had learned to bear in daily governing. Um, and I have to say, I mean, I'm I'm tremendously proud of Missoula. I think it's it's a, still a very good city, um, and um, but I know that to the extent it is a good city, 
it's because thousands of people have found ways of working together to continually make it a better city. And um, if I were to go back to the legislature again, which I'm not going to, <laughs> but if I if I did, what I would do would be to work very hard to have all of the communities in Montana share their stories about mm -hmm. what it has taken to accomplish whatever it is that that community is most proud of. Um, I, I would love to be able to go around and just have people identify what, what do you love most about this community? And then to ask, and what did it take to make that happen? so that we could refocus some of our energy on, and our attention on those ways in which, in fact, we have worked well together um, and, and created uh, communities that we are proud of. Hmm. I really like that. I really like that. Um... I'm wondering, so tell us about this book, Citizens United to Restore Our, Citizens Uniting to Restore Our Democracy. You wrote it in 2020. Um, you wrote it in a time of really tremendous, pol like probably the peak of polarization. I'm hoping that we, we've we already, it's in our rear view mirror and it's not ahead of us. Um, tell us about that. I mean, it, there, there's this strong conflict between what you just described, which is, you um, you know, what we're most proud of, what it took to to build community, and what I, I'm guessing the impetus for this book was, which was a sort of existential threat to Republican governance. Well, you said I wrote it in 2020. And it was published in 2020. It actually took me 10 years to mm -hmm. write that book because I began writing it in 2010, the yeah. year that the United States Supreme Court decided the Citizens United case. Uh -huh. um, I was so um, certain that that decision was going to do vast harm to our political system, which it has. Um, and at the same time, having had the experience of, of trying to bring people together um, in, in especially my own community, I was convinced that the, the strongest antidote to the problems that um, were created by that decision was not Citizens United, but Citizens Uniting. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to dig deeper into what, where I think democracy really works well um, and to to suggest ways that those abiding democratic strengths can be used to address the, the deepening democratic threats mm -hmm. in our political culture. Mm. Are you feeling, I mean, we are now officially in, in 2024, uh, we've got a, a big election in November, um, a rematch election likely, although I guess we still don't know that for sure. Um, are you feeling optimistic about our democracy? Are you feeling scared about the future of our democracy? Um, you know, you, what I what I like about your experience is you've sort of got you've got the on the ground experience at the local level in the state legislature, you know how politics works, but you've also written about it from a philosophical perspective and a theoretical perspective. Um, 
So with all that background, what do you make of where we stand today? Every day that I go out and walk on the riverfront trails in Missoula and think about the hundreds of people that have to come together to make that happen. And then when I think about uh, some of the good work that people across the West have done in preserving working landscapes and and um, and ecosystems, I I see that people still have a great problem solving capacity. And I think we have simply let our political system, go to rot um, th through too much influence of money, too much influence of partisanship. I think we have to get back to the basics of what it takes to solve problems together. And there, it's a big job, it's true. Things are in bad shape and I could easily become despairing about it, but and that hasn't happened yet. I still am, am sustained by what I see as the great goodwill and problem-solving capacity of people around me in my community, in this country, in this world. Hmm. I really appreciate that. I've got, um, I know we're coming up on time, but I've got a couple additional questions. Um, one, you know, we've alluded to this throughout our conversation, but I did want to ask you sort of directly about geography and about the politics of place. Um, why is geography important in your framework for, for solving problems and revitalizing public life? What role should geography or the natural environment play in, in governance? For me, it's a, it, it's a matter of the way people feel about the places they inhabit. Mm. Um, I, I, I think it's still true that most people who have lived in any given place for a good long time have a deep, deep affection for that place. They care about it. They feel sustained by it. They don't want to see it damaged. Um, they want it to be as good for their children and their grandchildren as it is for them. Those feelings are are deeply human mm -hmm. feelings and they persist. Um, those, to my mind, are much more important feelings than most of what drives the culture wars of mm -hmm. our time. Even though people do have strong feelings within those culture wars, I think they're, in the end, less important and, I hope, less powerful than those feelings that keep us together. Keep us together in our local places, in our ecosystems, and finally, keep us together as a species on this earth. So what does that what does that look like? How do you drawing from your time as as a mayor, as a speaker, as a legislator, how do you leverage people's affinity to towards place in a political context? How do you use the positive feelings that someone might have about their neighborhood or their city or their state um, to overcome the sort of partisan incentives or the culture war incentives? Is there anything that comes to mind from your experience? Well, I think part of it for what I would do 
would be to try to remind people of a how much they care for their local places and b what they've already done to make a good life within those places and then begin to invite thought and conversation about how do we scale that up? Mm. Um, we know we've got an earth to take care of. There are plenty of people with that awareness. I worry sometimes that, that a lot of those people are not making the connection between um, taking care of local places mm -hmm. and taking care of the earth. The fact is, we as a species have evolved um, as we are because we are good problem solvers. That's what, what we are as a species. Mm -hmm. And we can solve the big problems we have, but we've got to demand of ourselves political structures that enable us to do that. Mm. This is a really interesting conversation for me, and I'm wondering if my listeners are drawing the same parallels that I am. Um, because in Oregon right now... Um, trying to think of how to describe this. I don't know how closely you've you've heard about or followed the city of Portland um, and the challenges it's had over the last few years, but the-, the Yes, the I, I have. Yeah. yeah. The, the vibe is pretty negative um, from, especially externally. I think the vibe is from people outside the city of Portland, national media. Um, there's been a really negative narrative that I think has- um, um, damage the confidence that some folks uh, have locally. And there's also a bunch of really big unsolved problems that are impacting their lives. That's, that's negatively impacting um, their confidence in, in the city, but it does feel what I'm hearing from people who live there. I'm in the suburbs outside of the city, but I, I spend time in the city pretty frequently. Um, it does feel like the tide is turning even just a little bit. Um, and part of it is that there's this um, marketing campaign. I think it's from Wyden Kennedy, um, where the the billboards the billboard says Portland is what we make it, um, or Portland is what you make it, which I think is kind of drawing into what you're talking about. It's like this is our community, and we get to decide what it looks like. Um, so I love the the sort of you're giving us a framework to think through uh, a way forward, which I really appreciate. I, I'm so happy to hear you describe that little germ of a, a revitalization of a political culture. I, I have loved Portland for a long time and have loved Oregon for a long time as a, a good and important neighbor. And, um, I would be deeply distressed if if people did not uh, begin to do exactly what you're describing. Mm. They they also did this. You probably read about this. They uh, they voted on a brand new form of government that will uh, take effect um, after the next election um, with a bunch of new. It's like double the number, over double the number of counselors and uh, different responsibilities for the mayor. You know, we've got this public financing system for for candidates. So um, it's it's a change from a system, the sort of commission style that everybody agreed wasn't really working um, for the city. Um, and now we're in this sort of in between phase where I think there's varying degrees of of certainty about whether or not the new system is going to work or whether it'll be better or not. But I, it does feel like there's a sense, more of a sense of optimism now, in my opinion, than there was, you know, two years ago. Um, which is positive. Um, Good. So, so Daniel, we we are past time, and what I didn't spend any time on is your incredible political career <laughs> and your time as as um, a legislator, as speaker, as a twice elected mayor of I think the largest city in Montana. So, I guess my last question is going to be a broad one um, for people who are in elected office today, people like me and my colleagues. Um, who are navigating 
a very uncertain national political climate and some local challenges, which are complicated, um, you know, the situation with money and politics. Give us some advice. What would you've given some throughout this interview, which I think is really valuable, but what's your advice to people who are on the ground today in elected roles who are trying to keep our republic together, um, preserve democracy, preserve the places that we live? Um, any advice for, for those folks? Well, I I think I would go back to the first set of questions you asked about public hearings mm. and you read the passage where I said the one thing that doesn't happen very much in those public hearings is a public hearing <laughs> right. anything. Uh, what what I would advise is let's really concentrate on developing our capacity for listening to each other. We have plenty of, of tools for expressing our opinions and our convictions. Mm -hmm. What we still have too little of is the capacity to truly hear what other people are saying and to understand why they're saying it. Um, and so it, I think especially those people who are motivated to public service, um, I would encourage them to, to cultivate their capacity for active listening. Hmm. Very well said. Daniel, thank you for, for taking the time to chat with me today. And thank you for, for writing this book and, and this book. And I think there's actually a couple of other books that you've, you've um, written as well that leverage your experience doing the politics as an elected official and your, your, your background um, as a thinker, as a, a historian, as a philosopher. Um, it's just really useful really useful work for, I think, people in my shoes. So thank you, thank you for making the time to chat today. You're welcome. Thank you for your public service. <laughs>